Welcome to section 4.6. In this section, we're going to be talking about the concept of a basis and the dimension of a vector space. So for starters, a basis for a vector space V is a set of vectors S such that S spans V and S is Li. So over the last couple of sections, we've looked at the concept of a set spanning a vector space, and we looked at the concept of linear independence among the elements of a set. And we talked about being able to span a set or a vector space as efficiently as possible. This is exactly what a basis does. A basis is a set of vectors that will span the whole vector space. Okay, so we can create any vector in the vector space that we want. And this set has no unnecessary repeats of vectors. There are no unnecessary additions. We are as lean as we can possibly be in the set, but it still spans the vector space. This is a basis. So for example, if we look at the vector space R3 and we have these three vectors here, is S a basis for R3? Well, we could uh, set up a linear combination like C1, C2, C3, and then try to make this determination. But if you notice um, the pattern that appeared from the last couple, the calculation for spanning sets and for linear independence um, is essentially the same calculation. So if we take these vectors and put them into the columns of this matrix, so 1, 1, 1, 2, 0, 6, 4, 2, 2, and augment, I'm just going to keep this arbitrary. Just put some numbers over here. If we take this matrix and row reduce, so using EROs, we end up whittling it down to 1, 2, 4, 0, negative 2, 2, 0, 0, negative 6, so we are going to have a pivot in every column. Now I kept the right hand side purposefully vague um, because if we were testing for a spanning set to determine if it spans R3. So this means our matrix 1, 2, 4, 0, negative 2, 2, 0, 0, negative 6. If we were testing for a spanning set, we would have this equal to arbitrary variables A, B, and C. And if we could create some linear combination such that this has one unique solution, that means that the set spans the vector space. So this means because of the work we just did here, that's not going to affect what these are. They'll still be arbitrary values in terms of A, B, and C. So, but that means that this set has one unique solution. Thus, S spans R2, excuse me, R3. And if we were to test this set for linear independence, we would get the same outcome, but with all zeros in that augmented column. And this would give us one unique solution, right? Zero equals zero equals zero equals zero for C1, C2, and C3 in the linear combination. So this has one unique solution. Thus, S is Li. So therefore, S is a basis
for R3. So the fact that our process for testing spanning sets and linear independence, the fact that this process is the same, the only thing that changes is that augmented column, means that if we just look at the matrix of coefficients here, that can give us information for both. It can tell us if it spans the vector space, and it can tell us if the set is Li, and if it is both, then that means that S is a basis for the vector space. So this is gonna be a valuable tool because that means that if we're trying to show that something is a basis, um, we are not going to have to show spanning and show Li in both situations because the work will be the same for both. So we can use that same solution to claim both. Now, uh, every basis for a vector space, um, there is more than one way to write a basis for a vector space. Um, there's not necessarily one unique answer, but every basis for a vector space has the same number of vectors in it. So no matter how we constructed our basis, um, no matter what those vectors look like, there will be the same number of vectors in a basis. And this number is what we call the dimension of V. So the dimension of the vector space V, written dim of V, is the number of vectors in any basis for that vector space. So like for this last example, we saw that we have a set with three vectors in it and that this set does form a basis for R3. So that means the dimension of R3 would be three, right? Because that would be the number of vectors in any basis for R3. Now, consider <clears throat> Rn. So note that the dimension of Rn is n. So kind of like what I was just saying, dimension of R3 is three. The dimension of Rn is n. So it's just based on the number of components that they have. Uh, suppose we have a set of vectors v1 through vk in Rn. <clears throat> if we have the case where k is greater than n, so the number of vectors that we have is greater than the dimension of the vector space. So we have k columns, and we have n rows. If k is greater than n, as we row reduce this, even though we get pivots in these columns, there will still be leftover columns that we can't possibly put a pivot in because there's too many columns. So if k is greater than n, there's too many vectors here to make one unique solution. And so if this is all equal to the zero vector, this means that the set must be LD. <clears throat> so another way of saying this is if your vector, if your set of vectors has too many vectors in it, so it's more than the dimension, then the set must be LD because there must be a dependency. There's too many vectors, okay? So at least one of them or more needs to go, all right? So if K is greater than N, then the set is LD and cannot be a basis. If the number of vectors you have is less than the dimension, so we have, again, k columns and n rows. But in this case, n is the larger number. We get our pivots, but then we run out of columns to keep putting, or excuse me, yeah, we run out of columns to keep putting those pivots into. And so if we have it set equal to numerical values, we end up getting a one in the augmented column here with zeros in the coefficient matrix, which means that we cannot have 
a unique solution to that system. Now, if this was a zero, then that's not a problem because you have an all zero row. Um, but if it's a number like this, then that means that S fails to span Rn and thus cannot be a basis. So case one, you have too many vectors. It can't be LD. Case two, you have too few vectors. There's not enough there to span the vector space. Case three is kind of like the case that we just looked at in that previous example. If k equals n, so the number of vectors you have is equal to the dimension of the vector space, you have the same number of rows and columns. You're able to get the right number of pivots in those columns. <clears throat> This tells us that there might be a basis, okay? Now we say might um, because we don't know for a fact that we're going to produce a pivot in every column here. There could be <clears throat> uh, a pivot in every column. There also could be a totally all zero row. There could be no solution. Um, it just depends. But in these other cases, it was guaranteed. There's too many vectors. It has to be LD. It can't satisfy this condition. Case two, there's too few vectors. Uh, it can't satisfy this condition in order to span. In case three, it's just the right number of vectors. It matches the dimension, but that doesn't guarantee that it is a basis. Just because it has the right number of vectors doesn't mean that they span an RLI but that means that it might be a basis. So this dimensional test is very beneficial for us. It allows us to tell very quickly if something is not a basis, um, because if you don't have the right number of vectors, that immediately rules that out as a possibility. Now, <clears throat> when will this be a basis? Well, S will be a basis if and only if the matrix of the augmented vectors has a rank of n. Okay, so in other words, there's a pivot in every column or a pivot in every row. The matrix of the augmented vectors is invertible. This is equivalent. The determinant of the matrix of the augmented vectors is non-zero, which is also equivalent to invertibility, which is also equivalent to a rank of n, which is now equivalent to the fact that s would be a basis. So if we're looking to show that a set is a basis, to show that it is an LI set that spans a vector space, first thing we look at is their dimension. And we see, does the set have the right number of vectors? If it doesn't, that automatically eliminates either LI or span, and thus eliminates it being a basis. If it does have the right number of vectors, we can then test using the matrix to determine whether or not it is a basis. Okay, so this is kind of the, um, this is like the both or neither case for a basis, right? This is the one or the other case, right? It can't, it can't be LI, it can't span, it could be the other. In this case, it's either a both or neither situation, right? It's either going to solve both, like we saw in the first example, or it produces no solution and it's neither. Now, there are bases for all of these standard um, vector spaces that we've looked at so far in chapter four. Um, I wanna talk about some of the more important bases uh, and dimensions for these vector spaces. So the dimension of Rn, like I mentioned a little bit ago, is n. The standard basis for these vectors um, is going to be our kind of traditional vectors here. So for R3, for example, um, that would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. This is a set of three vectors, right? With a dimension of three. So it's the right size. And notice each component is covered here, the X, the Y, and the Z. So we can create 
any three-dimensional vector we want as some combination of these. Now, I like bringing this up because if you remember calculus three, these vectors each had their own name. These were the i, j, and k vectors in calc three, right? And if we wanted to write the vector v in terms of these vectors, you know, we do like three i plus two j minus, you know, five k, whatever. And that was another way of writing three, two, negative five, something like that. What we were doing back then is essentially creating a linear combination of these three vectors to write our vectors in, right? Like three, two, negative five became three i plus two j minus five k. Um, and these back in Calc 3 are called the standard basis vectors, um, but we don't really talk about why that is because obviously there's a lot more information that needed to go into this uh, in order to understand what that means. But this is the standard basis for R3. So in other words, if we need to come up with a basis for R3 or R2, R5, Rn, whatever, um, we'll stick with the simplest and the most standard basis that we can. No need to go creating more complicated bases when we have these available. Uh, similarly, the dimension of Pn is n plus 1. The standard basis, for example, for P3 would be 1x x squared and x cubed. So 1, 2, 3, 4 terms, right? So n plus 1. For m by n matrices, the dimension is m times n. So it's the product of the, dimen of the uh, dimensions of the matrix. Standard basis for m23, for example, that's 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And you get the idea. But basically, we put a one in each component, zeros everywhere else, and that forms our basis, our standard basis for M23. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Two times three is six. So it's the proper size. This is our standard basis for M23, for example. Uh, for mn, so this is an n by n square matrix. It's the same idea as m times n, except both dimensions are now n, so it's n squared. <clears throat> so the standard basis for m2, for example, would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So these form a basis for all 2x2 two two matrices, right? We can create any 2x2 two two matrix using a combination of these four, and they cannot create each other using a combination of each other. So they're not linearly dependent on each other. <clears throat> so let's take a look at a couple examples here. Is this set a basis for P2 of R? So this set has two vectors, and the dimension for P2 of R is 2 plus 1, which is 3. So our set doesn't have enough vectors in it. It has two vectors. It's supposed to have... It's supposed to have three in order to be a basis. So not a basis. And because it's so small, it cannot span P2 of R. And even just by looking at it, notice that both of these have constant terms and x terms, but no x squared terms. There's no way you're going to get all second degree polynomials or less 
included when you don't even have a square term in either of the vectors that went into it. Um, so there's not enough vectors, it can't span all of P2, meaning that it cannot be a basis for P2. What about this set down here? So we've got one, two, three, four, five vectors. And our dimension for M2 of R, that's 2 squared, which is 4. So if we see here, 5 vectors to 4, this is not a basis. So it must be LD. There must be too many vectors here to make the basis, so there has to be a linear dependency among these vectors. Now, an interesting note about this one, uh, if we check, we see the set here fails to span also. So, and this is a good point to make here, that just because we have too many vectors to be a basis, that means that the vectors are LD. That doesn't guarantee that it is a spanning set. Just because we have too many vectors, it doesn't mean that, oh, it's not LD, therefore it has to be a spanning set. It could still be neither. This just eliminates LI as a possibility. Same thing back up here with this example. We had too few vectors. That guarantees it cannot span P2. These two could still be LD. They could still be dependent on each other. That is not indicated in this dimensional test here. Okay, so we don't want to use this as, you know, the final conclusive matter on LI and span. All we're saying is, if it's too small, it cannot span, so it's not a basis. It might be Li. And then same thing here. Too many vectors, it has to be Ld, so not a basis. But it might not span. And in this case, it turns out it actually doesn't span. So in this case, it would actually be neither. Okay? But this is something we would have to check ourselves um, using the methods that we saw back in you know, 4.4 and 4.5. For this next example, find a basis and dimension for the null space of this system, of this matrix. So remember that the null space is the solution set to that uh, homogeneous equation, right? Ax equals zero. The solution set x And here we have x1, x2, x3, x4. So the null space is going to be four-dimensional. And we know that the null space is a subspace, in this case, of R4. That was something we proved back in section three, that the null space is a subspace of whatever vector space it's taking part in. So we know the null space is a subspace, but the question is, can we find a basis for that null space? Um, so the first thing we have to do is actually find the null space. So if we get, so 0, 1, 4, 6, 0, 1, negative 1, negative 2, with zeros, if we perform... The ER rows here, we have 0, 1, 4, 6 with 0, 0, 0, negative 5, and negative 8 with 0. So we get two pivots. So we get x4 is t, that's a free variable. Then we have negative 5x3 minus 8t equals 0. 
So x3 is negative 8 fifths t. And then x2 here, plus 4 times negative 8 fifths t, plus 6 times t, equals 0, gives us x2 is 2 fifths t. And x1, don't be fooled by the fact that these are both zeros. That doesn't mean that x1 is zero. It means that it is not specified in either equation and therefore can be anything. So we're gonna let x1 be r, which is another free variable. So we have again, two unpivoted columns. That's two free variables. So our null space is going to be the set that has the following form. So first component R, second is 2 fifths T, third is negative 8 fifths T, fourth component is T, such that T and R are both real numbers. So that would be the null space. So the null space of this system of equations um, says if we were to solve this homogeneous system here, the solutions would look like this, okay? For any values of r and t, the solution would look like this. And you could pick you know, arbitrary values of r and t and then go from there. But we don't just want the null space, we want the basis for the null space. So we're going to bust out the variables from this. We've got the r here, the t here. So if we look at the r, <clears throat> there's a one r right here, none, none, and none, plus the t, there's none here, but there's two fifths here, negative eight fifths here, and one here. <clears throat> So this is our linear combination of the vectors. But the basis is just the vectors themselves. Okay, so the linear combination here can produce any vector in the null space but the basis is just the list of vectors, the set of vectors that are li and that span, in this case, the null space. So the basis is just the vectors. So our basis is one, zero, 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 and zero, two fifths, negative eight fifths, and one. <clears throat> so this set of vectors span everything in the null space and they are li with each other. And you cannot use one to create the other. And again, they span the entire null space. So this is a basis for that null space. And it asks for the dimension as well. There's two vectors in the basis. So the dimension is two. <clears throat> right. So uh, a couple remarks to make down here at the bottom of the page. So this first one, I already touched on this a little bit, um, but if the dimension of a vector space is n and S has n vectors in it, <clears throat> again, this is that case where we have the right number of vectors, so it could be both, but it also could be neither. Um, S spans V if and only if S is Li. 
So this really does guarantee that we're kind of working with a package deal here. If your number of vectors matches the dimension, it is going to be either both or neither. Okay? It's either going to be a basis and will be both, or it will be neither of them simultaneously. Okay? Uh, if W is a subspace of V, so if we have a subspace, just like we had back with the null space there, the dimension of W is less than or equal to the dimension of V. And actually, if you look back at this one, the dimension of R4 would be 4. The dimension of our null space was 2. So 2 less than or equal to 4. So that tracks with that example. Um, but for exa another example here, if we have the vector space M2, and consider S, which is the set of all two by two symmetric matrices. So the set S would be matrices that look like this, A, B, B, C, where A, B, and C are real numbers. So A, B, B, C, if we bust out those variables, that's one with zeros plus B, 0, 1, 1, 0, plus C, 0, 0, 0, 1. Our basis is just the vectors themselves. So this would be the basis for all 2 by 2 symmetric matrices. So the dimension of S is 3, but the dimension of V of M2 is 4. So we do have the dimension of the subspace being less than or equal to the dimension of the vector space. So that does satisfy it. And last remark down here. If S is Li, so if a set is Li, then S is a basis for the span of S. So the conditions for something to be a basis are that it has to be Li and it has to span. Well, if we're looking at the span of S, okay, so that is all the vectors um, that are spanned by S, uh, if we know that S is Li, by definition, it's Li and it spans, then that means that it is a basis for the span of S. And that brings us to the end of section 4.6. Um, and it's kind of the culmination of our conversation on uh, spanning sets, on uh, linear independence and dependence, um, and the concept of a basis. Um, when we come back in sections 4.8 and 4.9, we're going to be looking at um, some additional bases that we can work with, um, how the uh, rank of a matrix is involved, the null space of a matrix is going to get involved, um, and we're going to see some additional um, <clears throat> equivalencies for our invertible matrix theorem. So we're going to see how all of this stuff plays into the invertibility of a matrix, and all of that will be coming up in the next couple of sections.